Hello, I'm glad to see you on my channel. We tell you about the history of the soldiers who took part in the Second World War. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. When we arrived at Hitler's hideout on the evening of April 26 at 7 p.m. for another report on the progress of hostilities, we found the reception room unusually lively. Here were General Ritter von Grimm, who arrived at the headquarters from Munich on the orders of the Führer, and delivered by the famous pilot Hannah Reich. During the flight, von Grimm was wounded in the leg by a piece of anti-aircraft gun shell, and while the doctor dealt with the wound, Hitler explained to von Grimm the reason for his urgent summons to the Imperial Chancery. He told the general about the betrayal going, not shy in expressions, scolded the Reichsmarschall, and finally produced Grimm in the field marshals, appointing him commander-in-chief of the German Air Force. I have not yet seen a man to such a degree of dumbfounded as General Grimm looked. He must have been most struck not so much by the reasons and surrounding circumstances of his unexpected promotion and appointment to such a high and responsible position, as by the fact that he had been torn away from really urgent matters and forced to travel all the way from Munich to Berlin, at the risk of losing his life or being taken prisoner, just to announce to him the changes in the leadership of the German Air Force. Before Recklin, his flight was over Allied-occupied territory and involved real danger, given the enemy's overwhelming air superiority. From Recklin to Berlin's Gato airfield, he was escorted by Luftwaffe fighters, where they landed safely despite heavy artillery fire. From there to the center of Berlin, they flew in a slow training plane, with General Green himself at the helm. When he was wounded over the Russian-occupied Grunwald, Reich took over the controls and skillfully landed the machine at the Brandenburg Gate. Hannah Reich and Hitler had known each other for a long time and greeted each other warmly. During the general conversation, Reich modestly kept aside, but nevertheless it was noticeable that this lovely, uncommon in all respects woman enjoyed the undivided respect of all present in the bunker. Two days later, Hitler thoughtfully handed her a vial of poison. In response on her face appeared only a faint smile, expressing selfless devotion. Returning from the meeting, we met Magda Goebbels in the passage. Surprisingly, but in the last tragic days, she, like Hannah Reich, did not show the slightest sense of fear or even concern. Her behavior might have seemed strange if one did not recall Mrs. Goebbels' fanatical, almost religious faith in Hitler's genius. To what extent she, this belief in that final period of Germany's agony was sincere, of course, we will never know. After all, one of the most important tools of Hitler's tragic power over the minds of Germans was, of course, inherent in his strong hypnotic effect on people, especially women. About half past nine, Major von Freytag contacted the supreme command of the Wehrmacht, According to the latest data, the advanced units of the 9th German Army, repulsing Russian attacks from the bridgehead of Frankfurt am Oder, crossed the highway Zossen, Baruth south of Berlin. The offensive of the German 12th Army developed extremely slowly due to stubborn enemy resistance in the wood area around Billitz. In the next 24 hours it will become, they say, clear what are the chances of success here. No information about the actions of the Holzkorps or about Steiner's offensive on Oranienburg was not received. Meanwhile, the Russians had seriously squeezed the 3rd Tank Army, moving from the area south of Stettin to New Brandenburg and New Strelitz. At about 23.00, we were again called to a meeting. On the way, Major von Freytag met near the kitchen Lieutenant Colonel Weiss, who was returning from Hitler's hideout. Waiting for the end of their conversation, I stood at the door leading into the kitchen and became an unwitting witness to a skirmish between the women dishwashers with the SS. Scolding the underground soldiers, they said, Look, if you don't start fighting soon, put on our aprons and we will take your weapons and go to fight. You should be ashamed of yourselves. 
Think of the children who are now up there knocking off Russian tanks. General Wadling, commander of the 56th Panzer Corps, who had won many awards for bravery and courage in battle, was waiting for an audience in the reception room. He looked very youthful and agile, despite his 55 years. According to von Freytag, Weidling Weidling was promoted to the post of military commandant of Berlin. This news, they say, told him just Lieutenant Colonel Weiss. Since April 23, these functions were alternately performed by young officers who, although devoted to the ideas of Nazism, did not have the necessary experience in the extraordinary conditions of combat operations and did not always cope with their very difficult duties. Now it was finally decided to entrust this position to a battle-hardened general. However, Weidling was a responsible enough man to accept his appointment to the new post unconditionally, given the extremely confused overall situation in Berlin. He agreed only on the condition that none of the occupants of the imperial chancellery would intrude into his sphere of competence. After some hesitation, Hitler expressed his willingness to honor this condition. The next morning, I was awakened with difficulty by Bernd von Freutag. The fans were not working. The air in the room was saturated with the pungent odor of sulfur mixed with the suffocating stench of wet concrete. Upstairs, it was hell. The bunker shook like an earthquake as shell after shell struck the imperial chancellery. After about a quarter of an hour, the intensity of the shelling diminished. Judging from the sounds of the bursts, Potsdamer Platz was now the main target. Bad news came from all parts of Berlin. For a whole week now, women, old people, invalids, and wounded soldiers had been forced to hide in cellars and among the ruined houses in the central part of the city. There was no organized system of providing the population with everything they needed. Thirst was worse than hunger, for the water supply had been out of operation for many days. Fires raged almost uncontrollably, filling cellars, temporary shelters and passageways with puffs of acrid smoke, and the hot April sun blazed mercilessly on all this bedlam. Hospitals, military hospitals, bomb shelters were long ago overflowing with wounded. Thousands of them, military and civilian, lay on the platforms and in the tunnels of the Berlin subway. No one will ever know how many there really were. But even in this desperate situation, some of the bunker's occupants cheered up when, at 10.30 p.m., it was possible to contact Wenk's army again. To the southwest of Potsdam, in the vast forest near Belitz, the advanced units of this army slightly squeezed the Russians and advanced in the direction of Schwilosi. They were separated only a few kilometers from Reumann's court, fighting near Potsdam, and in the bunker only talked about the short distance separating the 12th Army from Reumann's court and the impending unblocking of Berlin by General Wenk. But after a few hours from the location of Wenk's army came the message about persistent flank attacks of the Russians, and when later it became known that the advance of Wenk's army was stopped near the sanatorium Belitsa, and it is forced to conduct heavy defensive fighting, even incorrigible optimists realized. Three divisions are clearly not enough to break through the ring of encirclement of Berlin, the mood again plummeted sharply, and many finally dropped their hands. This morning, I saw Eva Braun for the first time. She sat, talking animatedly, in the reception room with Hitler and his closest associates. Hitler listened attentively to her. She was wearing a grey suit, emphasizing the slender figure and elegant shoes. I caught the eye of a beautiful diamond-studded lady's wristwatch. No words, quite an attractive woman, but somewhat tokenistic and pompous. When we entered, Hitler rose and strode into the office. We followed him. Despite the lack of any encouraging news from Wenk, the Führer continued to rely on him, like a drowning man on a straw, and sought to delay as far as possible the inevitable end of the battle for Berlin, not thinking about the thousands and thousands of Germans suffering from hunger, thirst and dying of wounds and soon he gave perhaps the most inhuman of all the orders that have been issued in recent days. Having learned 
that the Russians often overcome our defenses and come behind our troops, using the tunnels of the city subway. Hitler ordered to open the floodgates on the spree and flood all the tunnels south of the Imperial Chancellery, which hid tens of thousands of civilians and wounded soldiers. Most of them had died, but the fate of these people did not interest or touch him. After the meeting, we met Hannah Reich. She had already twice tried to take off at the Brandenburg Gate with the wounded Field Marshal von Grimm, but each time had to retreat because of the intense artillery fire. While in the bunker, Reich became close friends with Magda Goebbels, and I often saw them together. In the afternoon, Hitler's guards brought to the shelter a boy who was in severe shock and clearly had not slept for several nights, who, according to eyewitnesses, had just hit a Russian tank on Potsdamer Platz. With ostentatious solemnity, Hitler himself pinned the teenager's own iron cross to a too large coat that covered his skinny chest and sent him back into the street to certain death. Back in our rooms, Freitag wives, and I discussed this strange episode for a long time. As combat officers with many years of active service, it was distressing for us to be hiding in a shelter in relative safety while upstairs men were fighting to the death. Heated, we did not notice how Bormann was in the room and listened to our arguments for some time. Suddenly, he patronizingly put his arm around my shoulders and von Freitag talked about Wenck's army, the liberation of Berlin from the blockade, and the soon victorious end of the war. Then with some unnatural pathos he added, when the war is over with our victory, and this is not far off, all those who remained loyal to the Führer during the most difficult period for him will occupy responsible government positions and as a reward for their loyalty will receive large estates. And, smiling at us in a friendly manner, he slowly walked out. As if struck by thunder, I did not immediately find something to say, and I wanted to know. In fact, on April 27, 1945, Bormann could speak absolutely seriously about the victorious end of the war. And as before, when I had to listen to the reasoning of Bormann, Goebbels, Koering and other men in Hitler's entourage, I wondered again, did they really believe in what they were saying, or was it a diabolical mishmash of pretense, megalomania and fanatical stupidity? After the news came late in the afternoon that the advanced units of Wenck's army had reached the Furch near Schwilosi with fighting, the new commandant of Berlin insisted on a meeting with the Führer. Present at the conversation were Bormann, Krebs and Bogdorf, who stood silently behind Hitler's back. As explained by General Wadling, Wenck's army is too weak and in manpower and equipment to hold at least on the recaptured territory south of Potsdam or make their way to the center of Berlin. Meanwhile, the Berlin garrison has quite enough forces to make a breakthrough in the southwest direction with a good chance of success and join Wenck's army. My Führer, Wadling said further, I take personal responsibility to get you safely out of Berlin. This will save the capital of the Reich from destruction in the final stage of the battle. However, Hitler rejected the idea. The next morning, with a similar proposal, was made by Axman, who promised to provide a reliable escort of the most loyal members of the Hitler Youth but Hitler again refused to leave Berlin. Having learned that there was no help from Wenck's army and that Hitler categorically refused to leave the besieged city, the inhabitants of the bunker fell into despondency, as if they already saw the end of the world. We were still working hard, and most of them were already trying to drown their terror of the inevitable in alcohol. Stocks of fine food, the finest wines and schnapps, were kept in abundance in the storerooms of the Imperial Chancery, while countless wounded languished in cellars and subway tunnels, dying of hunger and thirst a hundred meters from the Führer's refuge, such as the Potsdamer Platz station. In the bunker itself, the wine poured out in rivers. About two o'clock in the morning, I, completely exhausted by the long hours of grueling work, lay down on the bed, expecting to sleep for a couple of hours. From the next room came a vague noise. Bormann, Krebs, and Bergdorf were sitting there drinking together. 
I had probably slept for two hours and a half when Bernd von Freytag, who was asleep on the lower bunk, woke me up and said, Old chap, you are missing something very interesting. Just listen. They have been talking like that for quite some time. I got up and listened to what was going on in the next room. And I heard Bergdorf addressing Bormann shouting. From the very beginning, when I accepted this position, about a year ago, I took up the task with all my inherent energy and faith in our ideals. I tried every way I could to reconcile the army and the party, and what happened? Former friends in the armed forces turned away from me, and some began to despise me. I tried my best to dispel Hitler's and the party's distrust of men in uniform. In the end, I was labelled a traitor who betrayed the German officer corps. And now I see that these accusations were quite fair, that I tried in vain and my ideals were wrong, naive and stupid. Bogdorf paused for a moment to catch his breath. Krebs calmed him down by reminding him of Bormann's presence, but Bergdorf stubbornly continued. Ah, leave me alone, Hans, please, it has to be said at some point. In forty-eight hours it will probably be too late. Our young officers went to war with great faith and enthusiasm. Hundreds of thousands of them died. And for what? For their homeland. For a great Germany. For our future. For a decent life for the German people. In their hearts they may have believed it, but in reality it was different. They died for you, for your luxurious living and your delusions of grandeur. The color of the German nation shed blood on battlefields everywhere. Millions of people were sacrificed, and you, the leaders of the party, while you filled your pockets with untold riches, you enjoyed life. Confiscated from the defeated magnificent estates, built fabulous palaces, bathed in luxury, deceived and oppressed the people. You have trampled our ideals, our sound morals, our faith and our souls into the mud. For you, the people were only a means to satisfy your insatiable lust for power. You destroyed our culture, which had a glorious history of many centuries. You destroyed the German people. You are terrible sinners, and you alone are to blame for our present tragedy. The general shouted the last phrase as if speaking in court under solemn oath. In the room next to reigned dead silence was heard only heavy breathing Bergdorf. Then came Bormann's voice. He expressed himself with restraint cautiously adhering to a friendly tone. There is no need to get personal, my friend, said Bormann. Someone may have gotten rich all of a sudden, but I had nothing to do with it. I swear on everything that I have holy. She is, old friend. And he swore on all that's holy. And I knew for a fact that Bormann took to his hands vast estates in Mecklenburg and Upper Bavaria and built a luxurious villa on Lake Kaimi and had he not just a few hours ago promised us large tracts of land. That was the price of the oath of office of the chief leader, after Hitler, of the National Socialist German Workers' Party. I tried to sleep again, but without success. On the morning of April 28, at 5.30, the Russian artillery began to bombard the Imperial Chancellery again. The intensity of the fire increased rapidly, and soon something unimaginable was going on outside. It was a living hell. In all my time at the front, I had never experienced such a long and powerful artillery preparation. The fans had to be turned off for an hour or more. On the upper level, shells broke through the ceilings in a number of places. One could hear huge blocks of concrete crashing to the floor. The deafening blows of airplane bombs mingled with the crisp bursts of artillery shells. Thousands of tons of metal and a tornado of fire rained down on the Imperial Chancery and the surrounding government buildings. The antenna of our 100-watt radio transmitter was smashed, and telephone communications with some of the defensive sectors were disrupted. We could maintain contact with the outside world only through messengers and with the radio equipment possessed by Lawrence, the propaganda ministry representative in the Fuhrer's headquarters. Whenever we thought that the shelling had reached its climax, we were invariably convinced that we were wrong again. 
there was an excruciating lack of fresh air. Most of us suffered from headaches and choking attacks. The heat in the rooms was annoying. Everyone was sweating terribly. Gradually, the inhabitants of the bunker fell into a semi-conscious state. When the shelling subsided for a short time, the Russians went on the attack again and again. The fighting was already going on at Alexanderplatz. The Russian tanks, moving from Halachester, approached Wilhelmstrasse. We were separated from the enemy no more than a thousand meters. Even selected units of the SS Volunteer Corps, Adolf Hitler, could not withstand the pressure of superior enemy forces. During the morning and toward noon, a number of our messengers somehow managed to reach the commandant of Berlin and return to the bunker unharmed. As with us in the center, the situation in all other parts of the city's defenses was deteriorating with disastrous rapidity. The Russians had almost completely seized the Charlottenburg area and, advancing from the north, came close to the main east-west artery of the city. The basis of defense of the central part of the city remained now only anti-aircraft batteries in Gimboltheim, Friedrichshain, and in the zoological garden and anti-aircraft machine guns on the administrative building of the oil company Shell. In the areas of these pockets of resistance, the Russians made no notable gains. But elsewhere, they penetrated quickly and in significant numbers almost unimpeded into the central quarters of the city. The sport plane on which Hannah Reich and Ritter von Grimm flew to Berlin on April 26, and on which they intended to leave the tormented city, was wrecked on April 28 during the morning bombardment. The care of the wounded was rapidly becoming an acute problem in all defensive sectors. There was a shortage of medical personnel, dressings, medicines, and above all drinking water. When I went downstairs at noon with the documents for the meeting, I found a strange, almost comical scene. After a heated night of polemics, Bergdorf, Prebs and Bormann had moved from their living and working quarters into the small front room of Hitler's private apartments. Snoring loudly and with their legs stretched out in front of them, all three, wrapped in woolen blankets, slept soundly in rows in their deep armchairs, leaning against the wall on the right. A few feet away from them, Hitler and Goebbels were sitting at a table, and Eva Braun was nestled on a bench against the wall on the left. When Hitler saw me, he stood up. It was not easy for both of us to step over his outstretched legs without waking the sleepers. Goebbels, who followed us into the office, also tried not to disturb them, which was not easy for him, given his mangled leg. Looking at his funny movements, Eva Braun could not help smiling. During the night of April 27, when all telephone communications were temporarily out of order, we still managed, albeit with great difficulty, to establish communication between the Imperial Chancery and the Supreme Command of the German Armed Forces. But already in the morning, at 5.00, this channel was again interrupted. We almost ceased to receive information about the situation in the troops fighting outside Berlin. Now Major von Freutag and I were left with only two sources of information, radio transmitter and receiver Lawrence and radio station 56th tank called General Weidling. The Imperial Chancellery itself no longer had any technical means of communication at all. When Hitler, using the radio station of the Ministry of Propaganda, personally asked the Supreme Command of the Wehrmacht to inform him of the results of the offensive Steiner strike group north of Berlin and Holst Corps west of the capital, the headquarters of the OK Gelu could not give precise information and sent an extremely evasive and vague answer. The information coming from the 9th Army had in fact little or no practical value. Advancing from Frankfurt am Oder, it reached with great difficulty and significant losses only to the boundary Zossen, Baruth south of Berlin. Squeezed in a small space in a huge mass of refugees, attacked from all sides by superior enemy forces, virtually deprived of transportation, ammunition, medicine and dressing material for the many wounded, the Ninth Army was simply unable to continue moving in a westerly direction. Steiner delayed, 
waiting for Hitler's permission to abandon positions on the Oder, and began the withdrawal westward five to six days later than it should have. In the area of Mecklenburg Marshal Rokossovsky's troops reached the line Neustrelitz, New Brandenburg, Ankem, and were preparing to go further west. Gradually, the threat of dismemberment of the defense of Berlin was looming. The Red Army units advancing from the north and east were ready to unite in the vicinity of Tiergarten. As a result, an eastern enclave, north of Frankfurterly, Alexanderplatz, Halachester, Landwehr Canal, including the city center and partially the districts of Friedrichshain and Prenzlauerberg, and a western enclave around the Wilmersdorf district, were to be formed, with a narrow corridor to the area near the Pisselsdorf bridges over the Hevel and the Imperial Sports Stadium, which was defended by Hitler Youth Units. Another enclave between Lake Wannsee and Potsdam, which also included Farnensel, was defended by the 20th Motorized Division. There was no communication with General Ryman's corps, encircled near Potsdam. On April 28, this corps southeast of Werder had contact across Lake Elt Gelto, at its narrowest point, with the 20th Corps of Wenck's army. My report on the situation in Berlin, which Hitler listened to in silence, took place to the incessant accompaniment of intense Russian artillery fire. When the shelter was shaken by several direct hits of heavy shells and heard the rumble of falling concrete ceilings of the upper level, Hitler, touching my arm with his left hand, interrupted me. Leaning on the armrest of the chair and turning to me, he asked, What caliber guns do you think they are firing from? Can these shells penetrate all the ceilings down to the lowest level? After all, you were at the front, fought in the war and should, in fact, know. I answered that the Russians used siege guns of the largest caliber and that, in my opinion, their power is still not enough to destroy the lower level of the bunker. Apparently, my answer satisfied Hitler, and he signaled me to continue the report. Returning from a meeting with the Führer, we met in the passage of Lieutenant General Failing, under escort of two armed SS from the Führer's personal guard. The epaulets and other insignia were torn from his uniform. I hardly recognized in this pale green, gaunt man the same brave and arrogant Feiglin whom I had often been accustomed to see in recent weeks. Somehow he managed to sneak out of the Imperial Chancery building unnoticed on April 26. But the very next day Hitler noticed the absence of Feiglin, Himmler's permanent representative in the Führer's headquarters. This seemed suspicious to him, and he immediately sent to search for his guards, who found the fugitive in his own home in Charlottenburg disguised in civilian clothes. Upon learning of the incident, all of Hitler's closest associates were furious at the desertion of such a high-ranking representative of the generals. Feiling was stripped of all ranks, positions, awards, and placed in a makeshift prison cell, where he stayed for twenty-four hours. When we met him, he was just being led for interrogation in the Forer's bunker. At 18.00, we were again to appear at the meeting at Hitler, although I could add almost nothing to what I had already reported at noon. It appears, however, that Bernd von Freutag had been fortunate enough to learn something quite important through the radio capabilities of Lawrence and Weidling. Unlike the previous days, this meeting was quite crowded. Among others, Goebbels, Bergdorf, Krebs, Admiral Voss, and almost all the liaison officers were also present. The reports received from the Ninth Army again, for the umpteenth time, unequivocally demonstrated that it is on the verge of total destruction and is absolutely unable to attack the overwhelming superiority of the enemy and to pass with fighting 25 to 30 kilometers separating it from Wenck's army. The 20th Corps of the 12th Army still held the occupied territory on the line Nijmegel, Belitz, fronting the 9th Army, but General Wenck did not have enough personnel and equipment to advance on Berlin or towards the 9th Army. The 20th Corps, fighting on the right flank of the army, fought heavy defensive battles, with difficulty holding off a continuously attacking enemy. On the left flank, 
the 41st Corps, commanded by General Holst, occupied a small cellar of men in positions of great length, without a single soldier or a single tank in reserve. Moreover, they were under constant pressure from Marshal Zhukov's armoured commons. To think that they are able to break through to Berlin is to indulge in pipe dreams. The commanders of these units would be happy to at least defend the existing line of defence. Steiner's main force, the newly formed 21st Army Group under General von Tippelskirk, occupied the northern bank of the Ruppin Canal and a narrow bridgehead on the other bank, facing an enemy dozens of times more powerful. With the available forces too weak, there was nothing to even think about advancing towards Berlin at least a few dozen metres more. The 25th Motorized and 7th Armoured Divisions, which were part of the 21st Army Group, had to be removed from their positions on the left flank near Oranienburg and removed from this group to throw against the advancing advanced units of Marshal Rokosovsky, who prepared to attack positions on the line Neustrelitz, New Brandenburg. Even Hitler finally realized, any hope of unblocking Berlin is ephemeral. This meeting did not reveal anything new, except what was already well known to all sensible inhabitants of the bunker, and yet the harsh truth, spoken aloud and unadorned, made an extremely heavy impression on all of us, including Hitler. Some relief was brought almost unbelievable news. The sports plane sent for Ritter von Grimm landed safely in the center of Berlin. He was immediately taken to a shelter to protect from artillery fire. Later, about 7 p.m., after waiting for another lull, a panting Lawrence came running in from the propaganda ministry with another sensational report. He had caught another BBC radio news broadcast from London. Reuters, in particular, informed listeners about the proposal of Reichsleiter SS Heinrich Immler to the Allies to declare on behalf of all German armed forces to agree to unconditional surrender. In fact, by then surrender negotiations had already been in full swing for five days with the Swedish Count Folk Bernadotte, mediated by the Swedish consulate in Lübeck. This news infuriated Hitler more than Hermann Göring's alleged desertion and treason. Göring's radiogram at least recognized the supremacy of the Führer's authority. Himmler, on the contrary, completely ignored Hitler and acted completely independently in a matter of the utmost importance to Germany's existence as a state. In addition, Hitler always considered Himmler the most loyal of his associates and political associates and now turned into ashes, still remaining remnants of faith in the devotion to him and the closest supporters of the common ideals. And Hitler experienced a fit of literally furious, uncontrollable rage, which I have not yet had to observe before in any of the people. He called Himmler's negotiations the most unconscionable and shameful betrayal in the history of mankind. After calming down a bit, Hitler retired with Bormann and Goebbels to his office, where the three of them had a long discussion while everyone else was waiting in the reception room. Appearing again, Hitler ordered to bring Fegling, arrested the day before, and began to question him at length about Himmler's activities and intentions. Fegling, however, could not say anything specific or noteworthy. Although there was no hard evidence of his involvement in Himmler's intrigues, Hitler immediately ordered the execution of the disgraced general, which was immediately executed in the courtyard of the Imperial Chancellery. The Führer took the news of Fegelein's execution in a state of pathological excitement. He ran up to Field Marshal Ritter von Grimm, still lying on a stretcher, and ordered him to immediately leave Berlin and go to Schleswig-Holstein to arrest Himmler. Hitler shouted his orders in uncontrollable hysteria, leaving no doubt that the best thing for von Grimm was to eliminate Himmler on the spot. Although both von Grimm and Herr Reich insisted that they wanted to share Hitler's fate, probably out of a sense of loyalty, they were unable to convince Hitler to change his mind. In an armoured personnel carrier both were taken to the plane, and they, to our great amazement, successfully took off in incredible conditions, 
and safely overcoming the dense anti-aircraft fire of the Russians over Berlin, without further adventures, landed on the night of April 28 at the airfield Recklin in Mecklenburg. One could only guess whether it was the result of a successful flight von Grimm or understandable fatigue after two hours of excitement, almost frenzy, but Hitler regained his composure and completely calmed down. Without saying a word to those present, with a cold, expressionless face, he retired to his lodgings. That same evening, Martin Bormann, in a radiogram to Domitz's headquarters near Plum, Schleswig-Holstein, openly accused the leaders of the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces, that is, Ketel and Jodel, in outright treason, because they, they say, did not do everything possible to organize assistance to the brutal blockade of Berlin. He concluded his message with the following words, The Imperial Chancellery has already been turned into a pile of ruins. Characteristic of Bormann were not only the accusations contained in the radiogram, but also the very manner of its transmission. He used for this purpose the facilities of Admiral von Puttkammer in Berchtesgaden, for he did not trust the technical services of the OKW. None of them, neither Bormann, nor Hitler, nor Goebbels, nor others from their inner circle, did not want to recognize that the German army finally exhausted and exhausted, that the enemy surpasses it many times over on all counts, and in manpower, and in logistics. In every failure or defeat, they immediately saw treason and intrigues of corrupt generals. At dawn on April 29, I was awakened by Bernd von Freitag. He was already sitting at his desk and working, and it was several minutes before he looked at me and calmly, as if by the way said, You know, Gerhard, last night our Führer got married. Seeing my astonishment, he laughed so loudly and merrily that I could not resist laughing with him. From behind the curtain that divided the room came the stern voice of General Krebs. Have you gentlemen gone completely mad, laughing so disrespectfully at the supreme leader of our state? After waiting for Krebs to leave the room, Byrne told me about the events of the previous night. Although it is hard to believe, but during the night there was a real wedding ceremony with the registration of the marriage, with loud and clear confirmations of the bride and groom of their desire to join the bonds of Hymen, with witnesses and a gala dinner. The formalities of the civil marriage were performed by an official of the Ministry of Propaganda, with Martin Bormann and Goebbels as witnesses. Guests at the festive table were Generals Krebs and Burdorf, Goebbels and his wife, Bormann, Hitler's secretaries, and Manziali, the Führer's cook, who prepared him vegetarian dishes. After a while, Hitler left the festive table and secluded himself with his personal secretary, Gertrude Junge, to dictate to her the texts of two wills. Political and private, the executor he determined Martin Bormann. As Bernd von Freutag learned, arrangements were made to make copies of these wills and give them to Admiral Dönitz, whom Hitler had chosen as his successor, and Field Marshal Schorner, commander of the group of armies fighting in Bohemia. To take the wills out of Berlin and deliver them to their destination were Hitler's army adjutant Major Mayer, Bormann's right-hand man, SS Standartin Frisander and Heinz Lorenz, an employee of the Ministry of Propaganda. When Byrne finished his narrative, we went back to our usual work, collating the scattered and fragmentary morning reports, and above, the battle in the center of the city continued to rage with unrelenting ferocity. Enemy shells and bombs were raining down continuously on the government quarter, and the Russian soldiers were steadily getting closer and closer. Around 9.00, the hurricane fire suddenly stopped, and soon our scouts reported that enemy tanks and infantry were already approaching Wilhelmplatz. Silence reigned in the bunker. In an atmosphere of almost inhuman tension, everyone listened sensitively to what was happening upstairs. Finally, about an hour later, Another scout reported that the Russians topped 400 to 500 meters from the Imperial Chancellery. In the midst of the general excitement, information came from General Weidling's headquarters 
about the still existing communication between the 12th Army, which occupied positions southeast of Werder, and General Ryman's corps encircled in the Potsdam area. In this message burned, and I saw our chance. All the last few days we had been discussing a subject of importance to us, how to get rid of our passive contemplation while sitting in the dungeon and take an active part in the combat operations above. When Krebs returned to the room, we already had both maps and written summaries ready to report on the situation on the fronts as of this morning. I reported on the progress of the fighting on Potsdamerstrasse and the results of efforts to hold back the Russian advance between Kantstrasse and Bismarckstrasse. All other reports received were, in my words, extremely confusing and contradictory. Major Bernd von Freutag then described the situation in Wenck's army and in Ryman's court, and mentioned the existing contact between them at a point southeast of Werder. Here was the right moment for the realization of our plan. Bernd endeavored to prove to the general the advisability of our going to the location of the 12th Army in order to familiarize General Wenck personally with the situation in Berlin and with the situation around the Imperial Chancery. According to Bernd, we could not only persuade Wenck to hurry up, but also serve as guides in choosing the best way to attack Berlin. I supported this idea to the best of my ability, emphasizing the fact that there was nothing more for both of us to do in the bunker. Krebs could not dare to say yes or no, fearing trouble with Hitler, but General Bergdorf, who soon joined us, enthusiastically accepted our proposal, considering it very reasonable and timely. His adjutant, Lieutenant Colonel Weiss, volunteered to accompany Bernd and me, our plan unexpectedly supported Anne Bormann. Together with Bergdorf, they convinced Krebs in the necessity of our trip, the details of which he should discuss with Hitler already at the next meeting. At 12.00 the Führer called another meeting with the participation of Bormann, Bergdorf and Goebbels. Reported Krebs, having at hand only maps with very approximate positions of the warring parties. More or less clear was the situation only in the center of the city. Representations of the situation in other Berlin pockets of resistance were rather uncertain and vague because they were based on rumors, conjectures and contradictory reports from the field. Krebs was going to secure Hitler's agreement to our plan. Never in my life have my nerves been so tense as at this very moment. Having finished reporting, Krebs, as if by the way, had it that three young officers volunteered to try to break out of Berlin to get to General Wenck, to describe to him in detail the situation in Berlin and in the Imperial Chancery and convince him of the need to rush to the aid of the besieged. Tearing his eyes off the map, Hitler raised his head and stared with unseeing eyes into space. After a brief silence, he asked, Who are these officers? Krebs gave our names and the necessary details of the plan. Again a few minutes of silence and incredible nervous tension. Every second seemed like an eternity. Freutag looked in my direction, and I knew his nerves, too, like mine, were taut as a string. Suddenly Hitler, looking me straight in the face, asked, How do you plan to get out of Berlin? I went to the table and explained our route, pointing out the main points of our movement, the Tiergarten, the subway station, Zorlijische Garten, Joachim Talistras, Karfestendam, Adolf Hitlerplatz, the sports stadium, the bridges at Pizzelsdorf. From here we intended to sail down the Havel in a paddle boat between the Russian positions to the Lake One Sea. Here Hitler interrupted me and, turning to Bormann, said, Bormann, provide these three officers with a motorboat, otherwise they will never reach their destination. I felt the blood rush to my head became hot. Was this idiotic motorboat destined to bury our magnificent plan? Where could Bormann have gotten the poor motorboat from in our present situation? Before Bormann could answer anything, I, gathering my courage, declared, My Führer, we will get the motorboat ourselves and adjust the motor so that it is not very noisy. I am convinced we will definitely get there. To our colossal relief, my answer satisfied Hitler. He slowly rose, 
looked tiredly at me and, shaking hands with the three of us, said, Give my regards to Wenk. Ask him to hurry, otherwise it will be too late. The documents necessary to pass through the German positions had been produced in advance, and now Bergdorf handed them to each of us. After this, we were finally able to leave the room. Once outside, in the passage, we shook hands joyfully. We once again had the opportunity to take part in the battle, albeit a rather ghostly one. But we would no longer have to sit idly in the dungeon, waiting for our fate to be decided. The clock read 12.45. We began to prepare for the hike. We stocked up on food, put on camouflage overalls and steel helmets. Finally, we slung our automatic rifles over our shoulders and distributed in our pockets the much-needed maps of the terrain along which our route lay. After briefly saying goodbye to our colleagues, we left the bunker at 1.30 p.m. on April 29 and set out on our way. Crouched behind the walls of the bunker exit on Hermann Göring Struss, we waited out another artillery raid. A long machine gun burst was heard from somewhere and bullets slammed into the wall above our heads. Thick puffs of black smoke were blown by the wind from Potsdamerplatz in our direction. Then we ran toward the Tiergarten, skirting bomb and shell craters, maneuvering between defeated and wrecked vehicles, numerous corpses of soldiers and civilians. Soon we left the zone of intense shelling and found ourselves in relative safety among residential neighborhoods. Suddenly six to eight Russian dive bombers appeared over our heads we rushed to the nearest entrance, and at that time bombs were already bursting outside, characteristic claps of air cannons could be heard. The entrance was full of people sitting and lying down. Desperate women, frightened children, soldiers who had lost their units, from the far corner came the moans of the wounded. We hurried onward. Around the mine crater lay nine or ten corpses in civilian clothes, some mutilated beyond recognition. Without delay, we continued on our way. The air was saturated with the odor of decomposing human bodies, dead horses, abandoned cars. Burning houses were everywhere. We crawled, scrambled, and stumbled along our chosen route, always striving westward. In the front gardens, we saw well-prepared artillery positions with intact guns belonging to the 56th Tank Corp which had been rendered completely useless for lack of shells. They had been silent for many days. In four hours we covered the distance, which in normal conditions would have taken no more than half an hour, and at about 18.00 reached the metro station, zoological garden, where we could rest for 30 minutes, catch our breath and gather our thoughts. Ground fighting was already going on in the immediate vicinity but around us we saw only frightened and desperate Belimers. Under the cover of darkness, we made our way past the ruins along Jochumstrass, Kalfestendam and Adolf Hitlerplatz. The first Russian tanks had already traversed these streets on the afternoon of April 29. The leader of the local self-defense unit, which consisted of members of the Hitler Youth, allocated us a teenager who was to take us in a car through the half-occupied territory to the Imperial Sports Stadium, where another fighting group of youngsters had settled. With extraordinary agility and dizzying speed, the teenager drove us through the western sector of Charlottenburg. In half an hour, we were already walking on the stone slabs of the Olympic Stadium. Not a soul in sight. The pale moon cast a quiet light on the seemingly ghostly undamaged buildings. We spent a few night hours with a small unit of Hitler youth in the premises located in the western wing of the stadium, and with the first signs of dawn went to the bridges over the Havel near Pisselsdorf. Our group, reinforced by a few soldiers, was already large enough to fend for itself if necessary. We were also joined by Colonel von Below. He left the Imperial Chancellery with a letter for Field Marshal Ketel a few hours after us. Hitler youth fighters, armed with rifles and FOSS patrons, occupied alone or in pairs the trenches and crevices on both sides of the Heerstrasse in front of the Pisselsdorf bridges. In the gloomy light of the beginning of the morning, against the milky sky, 
The silhouettes of the Russian tanks, which had taken up positions along the Heerstras, were clearly visible. They were no more than a kilometre away, near the railway station, and their guns were aimed at the bridges. In groups of three, we ran across the long bridge and, out of breath, fell to the ground on the other bank, glad that we were covered by a low hillock. The youth fighting group had entrenched themselves in a small grove beside the road. After a long search we finally found its commander, the district leader of the Hitler Youth Schlander in a jugout, arranged on the back slope of a shallow excavation. After checking our documents, he told us a sad story. When we entered the battle here, he said, there were five thousand of us, members of the Hitler Youth. There were practically no experienced soldiers among my men, but we had to fight with superior enemy forces. Our weapons were rifles and FOSS patrons. The guys are all inexperienced, untrained. Under hurricane artillery fire, which none of them had ever seen until then, they were dying by the hundreds. No reserves, no shift to give them at least a short rest or sleep. We went outside, and Schlunder added bitterly, The worst time for my boys is at night. When everything subsides, the desperate cries of the girls and women can clearly be heard. It was noticeable that Schlunder was tormented by doubts, but nevertheless Hitler's orders forced him and the teenagers to remain in positions near the bridges. These murderous, criminal orders pressed weapons into the hands of untrained children and threw them toward imminent death under the wheels of the enemy's monstrously powerful war machine. After midnight on May 1, we left in a dinghy from the island formed by the two arms of the Havel near Pizzelsdorf, taking a course for Lake Wannsee. It was ten kilometers behind the Soviet-occupied territory. According to information received the day before, they were still holding its position, here a unit of the 20th German Motorized Rifle Division. I was sitting on the bow, ready to open fire with my automatic rifle at any second. Behind me Lieutenant Colonel Weiss and Bernd von Freitag were working the oars. At first we kept to the middle of the broader arm, but, as we neared the monument to Kaiser Wilhelm, we noticed an anti-submarine barrier ahead and hastened to take shelter in the shadows near the west bank of the Havel. The night was starry and quite cool. Near Kladov, we sailed so close along the shore that we could clearly hear Russian speech the noise of running engines and other clanking sounds. At about 2.45 we passed Schwanenwerder. From the brightly lighted cottages, standing on the shore, we could hear the laughter and joyful cheers of the Russian officers who were overjoyed with victory. Immediately after Schwanenwerder our heavily laden boat was almost overturned by a strong gust of wind from Lake Wannsee. As soon as dawn broke on May 1, we were already on the sandy spit of the lake, opposite Schwanenwerde. As soon as we landed, to our great amazement, we noticed a well-camouflaged anti-tank gun holding our boat at gunpoint. The local combat unit was already planning to break through the encirclement on the night of May 1 and join up with Wenk's army south of Potsdam. At the command post, where we went to check our documents, we were warmly greeted by Major Mayor Zander and Lawrence, who had left the Imperial Chancery before us. They, together with Colonel Below, were going to go ashore somewhere between Kladov and Getov and then move westward on foot. We three stayed with the military unit. After all, our mission was connected with Wenk's army. The breakthrough was initially poorly thought out and poorly organized. The disaster occurred on the overpass leading to the bridge between the big and small lakes, Almost all the soldiers who rushed to the breakthrough were killed under hurricane machine gun and mortar fire. Countless bodies of the dead and wounded lay in heaps in the narrow space around and directly on the half-destroyed bridge. The few who had managed to break through to the other side and seize a tiny bridgehead were exterminated by the Russian counterattack. Lieutenant Colonel Weiss was taken prisoner. Burned and I took refuge in a nearby spruce tree. Even before dark we, working with our hands and feet, burrowed into the soft forest soil and camouflaged ourselves with last year's dry leaves. We were lucky. 
Although the Russians had been combing the area all day, they had not discovered us. At dawn on May 3, we changed our military uniforms for civilian clothes and learned that same day that the battle for Berlin was over and that Hitler was dead. This important news freed us from the assignment given earlier in the Imperial Chancellery. Had we both immediately directed our footsteps to the southwest, aiming to reach at first the crossing of the Elbe at Wittenberg. The route we had chosen lay through Telto and the former military training ground at Jutabok. We proceeded on the assumption that the Russians would rather stick to densely populated areas than to the deserted spaces of the abandoned training ground. The continuous stream of foreign laborers striving westward from Germany gave us the idea of posing as Luxembourg residents, making the long trek. We both had a fairly passable command of French to feel relatively confident in this role. Around noon, we had to endure some very unpleasant moments. Burned, and I was standing leaning against the railing of a bridge spanning a highway on which two endless columns of Russian troops were moving westward. We were so preoccupied with our thoughts and conversation that we did not even hear a military truck stop right behind us. A Russian officer touched my shoulder and, in broken German, began to ask about the road to the point he wanted to reach. In even more broken German, with a French accent, I gave him the required information. With a feeling of great relief, we looked after the truck as it drove away. And at that moment, we were shocked even more. In the back of the truck, together with a dozen German prisoners of war, sat Lieutenant Colonel Weiss, whom we had last seen during the breakthrough at Lake Wansee. The next day, we reached Lake Blankensee and went to bed in an uninhabited hunting hut. At one o'clock in the morning, we were awakened by loud screams. The light of pocket lanterns shone directly into our eyes. The muzzles of rifles stuck from outside the window were pointed directly at us, a Russian military patrol. But we played so perfectly the part of foreign laborers, hijacked by the Germans, and now returning home, that after a short exchange of remarks, the Russians left us alone and went on their way. The sun was setting, and we had just passed the last house of an empty village on the territory of the military training ground near Jutabok, when a Soviet military truck suddenly came around the corner and braked with a grinding noise next to us. In the blink of an eye a dozen Russian soldiers, headed by the commissar, jumped out onto the road and surrounded us, holding us at gunpoint. With feigned indignation, we endeavored to refute all accusations of belonging to the German armed forces. We assured and swore, using many French expressions and accompanying our words with the liveliest gesticulations. But our performance apparently did not convince them very much. After some hesitation, they decided to search the strange French workers. As a result, the Russian soldiers seized from us army wristwatches, compasses, chocolates, amulets and, what bad luck, the staff maps. Irrefutable evidence. The commissar, shaking the map and compasses, excitedly repeated, a German's old at. Suddenly he ordered us to get on the ground, and we were beginning to fear the worst-case scenario. But nothing happened. It was just our boots that caught the commissar's attention. While one soldier, following the order of the older man, pulled off our shoes, a heated argument broke out among the others over the rest of the booty. The dispute gradually turned into a real quarrel, in which, fortunately for us, the commissar took a direct part. In the heat of the bickering, we were completely forgotten. At that moment, a handsome elderly Russian soldier came up to us and pointed expressively with his thumb in our direction. We understood and disappeared around the nearest corner in our socks. The next day, at the road sign with the inscription Wittenberg, 18 kilometers, we again ran into a Russian military post hidden from view by a bend in the road. We were escorted to a group of 60 or 70 French, Dutch and Belgians, and together with them, placed in a transfer camp for foreign workers, located eight kilometers from the place of our detention. Ironically, all the Germans were released without further delay and allowed to go wherever they wanted. At the camp, we were re-registered 
and told that we would soon all be sent west in American trucks. Burned, and I preferred to act on our own, and, leaving the camp the same night, we reached Wittenberg in twenty-four hours without adventure. We spent the next few days trying to find a way to cross the Elbe unnoticed. One foggy morning, we managed to do it five kilometers downstream from Wittenberg. In the end, however, near Oranian Baum, in the area between the Elbe and the Mold, we again found ourselves in Russian-occupied territory. The first attempt to cross the Mold ended in failure. The current was too fast for me, weakened by illness. Finally, at noon on May 11, north of Ragoon, we found a suitable place and safely overcame this obstacle. On the other bank we fell on the grass, tired but happy. At last we were in the American zone of occupation. The next morning, at five o'clock, we sadly said goodbye to each other. Bernd had to go south toward Leipzig, and I had to go north to Lübeck. During the weeks of traveling together, we have become good friends and trusted each other. I had to walk for almost two more weeks before I was able to embrace my wife and child at the end of May. In early 1946, I was arrested by the British authorities and placed in a filtration camp. I was then transferred to an internment camp where I began to write my memoirs. The Death of Hitler The End of the Imperial Chancellery the surrender of Berlin. As I learned later, the situation in Berlin on April 29 and 30 further deteriorated. On April 29, the commandant of the defense of Berlin, General Wadling again, proposed to Hitler to organize a breakthrough with all forces in the direction of Potsdam to connect with the army of General Wenck. And Hitler again refused to follow this advice. On April 30, between 15.00 and 16.00, the Führer shot himself in his apartment, located in the bunker of the Imperial Chancery. Eva Braun committed suicide at the same time by taking a powerful poison. The bodies of both, wrapped in blankets, were taken to the courtyard of the Imperial Chancery, doused with gasoline and burned. By order of Goebbels, General Krebs, that same night began negotiations with the commander of the Red Army in Berlin, Marshal Zhukov, on a temporary cessation of hostilities in the city. However, these negotiations, long and tedious, did not yield positive results. Only 24 hours after the death of the Fuhrer Goebbels and Bormann, found it necessary to inform about this event Admiral Dönitz, whom Hitler appointed in his will as his successor. In general, Goebbels found himself in a desperate situation, when the armistice negotiations ended in nothing. At noon on May 1, he poisoned five of his children. A few hours later, between 20.00 and 21.00, an SS guard, following Goebbels' orders, shot him and his wife, Magda, in the courtyard of the Imperial Chancellery. Goebbels' adjutant, SS Hauptsturm für Schwiegermann, was instructed to douse their bodies with gasoline and burn them. Meanwhile, the remaining occupants of the Imperial Chancellery intended, under the leadership of Monk and Bormann, to try to break out of Berlin to the west. At about 22.00, they went on the attack in three separate groups, passing through the subway tunnels from Wilhelmplatz Station to Friedrichstrasse Station and coming to the surface in the area of the Weidendam Bridge. This attempt ended in failure. Only a few people made their way west. According to Axman, not confirmed by other sources, Bormann and Dr. Ludwig Stumpfegger were killed, died at the same time and Hoovel. Monk remained in Russian captivity until 1956. Generals Krebs and Bergdorf committed suicide. On the night of May 1, General Wadling, commandant of Berlin, agreed with Marshal Zhukov on the terms of surrender of all German military units defending the city. General Wadling himself was captured and taken to an unknown destination. It was assumed that with the announcement of the surrender will cease all hostilities. However, for two more days, there were small pockets of resistance in Berlin and individual armed groups 
made desperate efforts to avoid Russian capture. On May 4, it was all over. The end of the Wehrmacht High Command and the government of Admiral Dönitz. As we already know, on April 22, 1945, the headquarters of the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces was transferred to Kramplitz near Potsdam, but due to the approach of Russian tanks, it had to move the very next day to Furstenberg, 70 kilometers north of Berlin. Here, as I was told later, she stayed until April 29, that is, until the day when the Russian troops came close to the city and it became necessary to move to Dobbin, South Mecklenburg. From April 22 and until May 1, its main task, the OKKLU headquarters, considered the organization of assistance to Berlin. Keitel and especially Joel worked on its solution, sparing no effort. During this period, Keitel could be found at one or another command post of the army, corps or division, which was supposed to be used to save the capital of the Third Reich. On May 1, by order of the new head of state, Admiral Dunitz, the Wehrmacht High Command moved to Plum schleswig holstein where Dunitz and his headquarters settled. When Dunitz determined the seat of his government in the city of Flensburg, the headquarters of the OKW also went there. On the initiative of Dunitz on May 2, negotiations began between Admiral Hans von Friedeberg and Field Marshal Bernard Low Montgomery on the terms of surrender of German military units operating in northern Germany. The first to put his signature under the Act of Unconditional Surrender on May 7 at 2.45 in the headquarters of Eisenhower in Reims, Colonel General Jodl. Fighting on all fronts was to cease at midnight on May 9. Delaying, and to a certain extent successfully, Negotiations on a ceasefire and unconditional surrender, Admiral Dunitz was guided by the following considerations. 1. It was very important to gain time for the completion of operations for the removal by sea of German troops from the Vistula Delta and Koland, for which all available watercraft were used. 2. It was necessary to have time to move Army Group Vistula from the area of Mecklenburg to the west included in the group of the 3rd Panzer Army and 21st Panzer Army, accompanied a huge mass of refugees from Pomerania, Mecklenburg and Stettin. When the British leadership accepted the May 5 announcement from Admiral Dönitz of the surrender of German military units in North Germany, British and American troops stood on the line Ludwigslust, Schwerin, Wismar. Dönitz wanted as many refugees and German military as possible to pass this line. 3. Time was also an extremely important factor for Army Group Center of 1.2 million men under Field Marshal Shauna, which was stuck in Bohemia. The main forces of the 1st and 4th Panzer Armies and the 17th Panzer Army were concentrated on May 6 in the Giant Mountains area, roughly on the gorlitz glatz line, west of Ostrava and Brunn. The distance to the American front line at Karlsbad plus and Passau, reached in some places 250 kilometers. To top it all off, the Czechs revolted in Bohemia and Moravia. Field Marshal Shauna, commander of Army Group Center, appointed by Hitler in his will as chief of the general staff, saving his own life, abandoned his troops, which were in a desperate situation, and fled to the west. May 9, 1945 in Berlin, Karl Schorst at 16.00 was signed the Act of Unconditional Surrender of Germany. The document was signed by Field Marshal General Ketel, Admiral von Friedeberg and General Stumpf. The Act went into effect immediately. Field Marshal General Ketel, Colonel General Jodl and SS Obergruppen für Colton Brunner were sentenced to death by the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg and hanged. The last days under Adolf Hitler, 1945 G. As one of those who lived through the events of April 1945, outside the walls and inside the Reich Chancery, I want to recount some of my memories related to these events, beginning on April 20, Hitler's last birthday. 
Berlin and the eastern outskirts of the city were already under the occasional gunfire of small-caliber Russian artillery from long distances. A few enemy bombers and reconnaissance planes circled over the eastern part of the city, especially before and just after dusk, but they kept at a respectful distance from our anti-aircraft guns on the air defense towers, which, in addition to providing air defense, quite often silenced the Russian long-range guns with an accurate salvo. The fighting had already reached the farthest outskirts of East Berlin, for at Frankfurt am Oder and Kustrin, General Boss's 9th Army had been defeated and our defences on the Oder had fallen. The Chief of Supreme Command and his Chief of Operations and their closest aides were still working in the command post built in 1936 on Franway in Dolem by War Minister von Blomberg while the operational headquarters of the OKB had abandoned their nearby apartments in the Air Force Command, building on Kronprinzeli, and moved to the War Ministry bunker in Wunsdorf in Zossen. Jodl and I also had our own spare apartments there, and I myself took up residence in No. 16 Frenwick, in the house of the former boxing champion Schmanning. Sometime around noon on April 20, the British and American air forces made their last massive air raid on the centre of Berlin, where the government quarter was located. We, together with my wife, Grand Admiral Dunitz, and his wife, and our adjutants, watched this frenetic and terrifying spectacle from a small hill in the garden of the Grand Admiral's service apartment. He had returned to Berlin the previous night from Coral, his operational headquarters near Everswald because of the threat of a Russian offensive there. During this final major bombardment in fine sunny weather, the Reich Chancellery building, already badly damaged, escaped further destruction. Our fighter squadrons were unable to repel this attack on Berlin, and our anti-aircraft guns were simply powerless against an enemy attack from such an altitude. The raid lasted nearly two hours, the bombers passed aloft in close formation, as if it were an aerial performance in peacetime, and dropped their bombs strictly at the same time. The military meeting that evening was scheduled for four o'clock and was held in the Führer's bunker under the Reich Chancellery building. As soon as Jodl and I appeared in the bunker, we immediately saw the Führer, accompanied by Goebbels and Himmler, going up to the workrooms of the Reich Chancellery. I declined an invitation from one of the adjutants to join them, as I had not yet had an opportunity to greet the Führer. I knew that Hitler youth boys were lined up on the stairs of the Reich Chancellery to receive orders, including several iron crosses, for bravery during enemy air raids and for distinguished service in the air defense squads and units. When the Führer returned to the bunker, Goring, Donitz, Hetel, and Jodl were separately summoned to his small meeting room next to the cabinet room to congratulate him on the occasion of his birthday. All the other people in the meeting were simply greeted by the Führer with a handshake as he came out into the cabinet, and no further attention was paid to his birthday. When I found myself alone with the Führer, I realized that I was simply not able to congratulate him, so I said only that the merciful rescue in the terrorist attack of July 20 allowed him to live until today, his birthday and to keep in his hands all supreme power at such a serious moment when the rake he had created was under unprecedented threat, which inspires us with confidence that he will make the necessary decision in this situation. I said that I thought he should begin negotiations for surrender before the capital of the Reich became a battlefield. I was about to continue in this vein when he stopped me by saying, Ketel, I know what I want. I am going to keep fighting, both in Berlin itself and outside it. This sounded like an empty motto to me, and he foresaw that I would try to talk him out of the idea. So he held out his hand to me and said, Thank you. Would you please get Jodel? We'll talk more about this later. And I left the room. What he talked to Jodel about, I never found out. The military meeting was held in its usual rhythm in the oppressive walls of the bunker office. General Krebs of the War Ministry reported on the situation on the Eastern Front and Jodl in the remaining theatres of war. Meanwhile, 
Goering, and I retired to private rooms and discussed his intention to evacuate his operational headquarters to Berchtesgaden, since Karenhol was already in grave danger and the Kurfürst, the operational headquarters of the Air Force, was already out of contact from time to time. Goering was going to go by car, so it was already time for him to go, as there was only one main road left between Hal and Leipzig in a southerly direction, which I knew was still free of advanced enemy units. I advised Goering to go, and he asked me if I would ask Hitler to move the Air Force operational headquarters to Berchtesgaden. Despite the critical situation, in the Italian theatre of war, the meeting was calm, without the usual unbalanced explosions. The forer made several precise and objective decisions. His excitability he kept under complete control. When I put forward the suggestion that Goering should be withdrawn to the south before communication with him was finally lost, he agreed and quickly went out to suggest this to Goering himself. My motives for this action could probably be explained by my firm conviction at the time that Hitler and the operational headquarters of the OK Golu, as had been stipulated in our orders, were also to move their high command to Berchtesgaden, even in the event that the fighting around Berlin did not intensify. If necessary, they could be withdrawn by airplane and at night. The airplanes for this purpose were already ready, and all those who were not vital at the Führer's headquarters in Berlin had already been sent to Berchtesgaden on special trains and in convoys of trucks. The same applied to the OKW and the War Ministry, which were divided into a joint Northern Command Headquarters, Fultonitz, and a Southern Command Headquarters in Berchtesgaden. Dunitz was to take command of all branches of the armed forces in North Germany, after Central and South Germany had been cut off from the North by American and Russian forces joining south of Berlin. Hitler himself signed these orders as he planned to move south, maintaining radio contact with Dunitz. On April 20, on my return to Dahlem, I informed Joel of my decision to send by plane to Berchtesgaden everyone who could be relieved from service. My own special train had already left there two days earlier. Under the command of my adjutant, Simonski, my private plane made a perfect takeoff in broad daylight under the control of aircraft engineer Funk and a full crew taking General Winter, Dr. Lehmann, Frau Jodl, and my wife to Prague, where a service car was waiting to take them to Berchtesgaden. That same evening, the airplane returned to Berlin and was again at my disposal. All this was done in order to relieve tension and to prepare for the imminent move of the Führer's headquarters to Berchtesgaden, since at that moment it was beyond a doubt. April 21. General Schorner, commander of the largest and strongest group of armies on the Eastern Front, operating from the Carpathians almost all the way to Frankfurt am Oder in the south, arrived at the Führer for a personal report on the situation. Their meeting was held in complete secrecy, and when that same evening, Jodl and I entered the bunker of the Führer, Shona was just saying goodbye to him. It was evident that the Führer was very enthusiastic about their conversation. He made some optimistic remarks, to which Shona agreed, and then asked us to congratulate the latest Field Marshal of Germany. In the course of the military meeting, it became quite clear that Shona had inspired the Führer with excessive confidence in the capabilities of his front and his own leadership qualities, and now Hitler grasped at it like a drowning man grasping at straws, completely ignoring the fact that in the end it was only a small section of the front which could still somehow resist. The situation in the West and in Italy was hopeless. The Russians stood at the gates of Berlin. The mood of the Führer improved even more when, unexpectedly for us at the meeting, appeared General Wenk, commander of the newly formed 12th Army, and reported to Hitler about the situation of his divisions, his operational objectives, and the schedule for his surprise attack on the American formations operating in the Haas area and moving to the Elbe. Since General Wenk survived and was taken prisoner by the Americans, I wished to leave it to him to recount his then intentions, objectives, 
and plans himself sometime in the future, since I myself have no maps or documents to check against. The Foro greatly appreciated Wenk as an active but prudent staff officer when he got to know him better. He was chief of the general staff Guderian's closest colleague, his right-hand man and constant spokesman, which is why he was chosen by the Foro as commander of the newly formed 12th Army. This latter was expected to bring about a change in the situation between the mountains of central Germany and the Elbe by clearing the enemy forces. It was assumed that they were weak. From the Magdeburg, Lundberg, Brunswick area, and to link up with the Panzer Group that had forced the Elbe south of Lauenburg and was fighting in the vicinity of Julesen. In view of the improvisational nature of its formation, the complexity of the situation, which tied our forces hand and foot, as well as the numerical disadvantage of this army, I did not at all understand the optimism of the Führer and General Wenk. I am sure that Wenk did not really hope to achieve anything more than a local success and certainly not a strategic victory. Even so, Hitler's apparent self-deception was only increased by those generals he trusted, which in turn gave him the hopes that proved fatal for us. Only those who, like me, have witnessed hundreds of cases in which even the highest commanders did not dare at such times to cross the Führer and tell him what they think, and what they consider feasible, can rightly reject the reproach of weakness of the Fora's inner circle. When Jodl and I, as is our tradition, rode home together in my car that evening after the meeting, we both expressed surprise that the Fora seemed so optimistic, or at least could speak so confidently. Shauna and Wenk must have breathed new hope into him. Did he not really see how hopeless our situation was? No, he certainly realized it, but he refused to allow it to be true.